I'm so glad to be back here, especially uh, speaking about Bitcoin uh, to a very warm crowd. And thank you so much for coming today. So, um, did everybody enjoy lunch? Feeling a bit sleepy? <laughs> All right, we're going to make this fun. I hope we're going to make this fun and just wake everybody up and get back to business. So let me start with a quick question. How many people in this audience are familiar with Bitcoin? Okay. I think I saw three hands not go up. How many people in this audience have Bitcoin or have used Bitcoin? Fantastic. And those of you who didn't raise your hand now, find one of the other people who did raise their hand and have them show you how to use Bitcoin. Come to me after the talk. I would be delighted to not only show you how to use it, but also to give you uh, a small amount of Bitcoin so you can try it out. Not a whole Bitcoin, no, um, a fraction, uh, a few millibits, uh, but you can try it out and see how it works. I think it's important to experience Bitcoin. Today I want to talk about the history of money. So a lot of people ask me, you know, I can talk about the latest things in Bitcoin, but really what I want to talk about is ancient history. I want to provide a historical context for money and talk about why Bitcoin is important in this historical context. So first, a little pop quiz for the audience. If you think of money as technology, as a technological system that human civilization has invented, how old is this technology? Any ideas? How old is the money technology? <laughs> Lots of diff different answers here. It's always surprising to me that people will say, you know, it's uh, uh, 400 years old, 1,000 years old, 2,000 years old. Uh, in fact, we, we don't really know how old money is. And part of the reason we don't know why, how old money is, is because we have yet to discover a civilization old enough that didn't have money. Uh, so we know it's as old as civilization. And one thing that surprises people is that money is older than writing. And the way we know this is because when we look at archaeological discoveries of writing, we find hieroglyphics and we find uh, cuneiform, and we look at all of these ancient forms of writing. Guess what they're writing about? Money. They're writing ledgers. All of the ancient writing we find, the first forms of writing, are ledgers. They are writing about money, because money is older than writing. Is money older than the wheel? I don't know, but we do know that wheels were used as money. <laughs> so they might be as old as wheels. Perhaps the first wheel was sold for money or was used as a form of money itself. Uh, archaeological sites going back into the Stone Age show us the presence of money in the form of shells and feathers and beads used by Stone Age people. In fact, we can teach primates how to use money. If you have, and they've done several studies where they teach monkeys, uh, chimpanzees, how to use money. They teach them that a specific type of stone can be exchanged for bananas, and then they try to see what the monkeys will do with this new information, and they very quickly invent armed robbery. because they figure out that if you beat up the other money and take, monkey and take its stones, you can exchange them for bananas. Surprisingly, the second thing they invent is prostitution. Um, they figure out that sexual favors can be exchanged for stones, which can be used for bananas. What does that tell you about the nature of money? I think the important insight into the nature of money is that money is a form of communication. At its very basic level, money isn't value. Money represents an abstraction of value. It's a way of communicating value. It's a language. And therefore, money is as old as language, because the ability to communicate value is as old as language. And money, in many ways, has these characteristics that make it a linguistic construct. So it's a form of communication. We use money to communicate value to each other, to express to each other how much we value a product, a service, a gesture. 
uh, we use it as the basis of social interaction because by communicating value to each other, we create social bonds. So money is also a very important social construct. So this is an ancient technology. And yet, ironically, it's one of the technologies that is least studied from a historical and technology perspective. We look at Bitcoin today, and it represents an invention, a new form of doing money. And think about for a moment how often the technology of money has been transformed by invention. How many different forms of money we've had. At a very basic level, the way to communicate value is to exchange things that we consider equal value. Here's a goat. I will take 20 bananas for my goat. That's not really money, because it's a barter transaction, but it's the first form of communication about value. And then we start seeing abstract forms of money. So that's the first major technological evolution, is to start exchanging something that you can't eat. A feather, a bead, a string with knots on it, a colorful something that can be used for aesthetic purposes, and then money takes this abstract form. That's the first major transformational technology moment for money, when money stopped being about the tangible consumption of intrinsic value, but became something that referred to value as an abstraction. Very quickly, one of the most popular forms of these abstractions was to use precious metals, to express value, precious metals, combine some of the most important characteristics of money being uh, hard to find, scarce, easily transportable, uh, more, for example, than a giant rock or uh, a whole barrel of feathers or other forms of money. Um, easy to divide, you can cut a gold coin into pieces and uh, subdivide the pieces and universally valued for aesthetic purposes. That's a major second transformation in technology. And it took thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, before we saw the introduction of precious metals, which is the beginning of the agrarian civilizations in the fertile uh, crescent area in the Middle East. We start seeing precious metals. The Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Romans, the Greeks developed these precious metals. Two, major technological revolutions, and then nothing for a few thousand years. And then someone came up with this brilliant idea, which was, well, if I deposit my gold with someone trustworthy, then they can give me a piece of paper that says that I have my gold in this trustworthy vault, and I could then really start trading the paper instead of the gold. It's easier to carry, and as long as I still trust that my money is in the vault, then I've got a new form of money. Now, with every technological revolution in money, there comes skepticism. And I think this is the moment of the greatest amount of skepticism in human civilization. Uh, for a lot of people, this new invention of money as paper was mm, somewhat controversial. You think people are freaking out about Bitcoin? Imagine how much they freaked out when you told them that now, instead of trading in gold, they would trade in pieces of paper. Uh, for a lot of people, this was unthinkable. I mean, after all, clearly this thing does not have any value. It took about 400 years for paper as money to accept, to, to become accepted broadly. And trust me, it was a big aberration. Then about 60 years ago, we saw a new form of money in the form of plastic cards. In fact, the first cards were paper, again. And then, um, in the United States, Diners Club was the first to create a credit card, which was a form of traveler's check. And then people took that and they said, this isn't money. Why don't you give me some of the good old paper money that I know? <laughs> and that was another big transformation in money. And now we have Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is in my mind, a pretty radical transformation is as radical as the change from precious metals to paper money. Perhaps even more radical. So what is Bitcoin? This is the fundamental issue in describing Bitcoin, is that if you use references to our existing experience, that experience is based on thousands of years 
of understanding what money is in a very physical form, and now we try to explain a form of money that is completely abstract, that is a token that represents acceptance in a network, a network-centric form of money, but it doesn't even begin to describe what this thing is. And so one of the fundamental misunderstandings that I get when I try to describe Bitcoin is that people think it's simply a payment system. That Bitcoin is simply a form of digitization of money. It's like, it's digital money, great. Well, that's kind of pointless because we already have digital money. All of you use digital money every day long before Bitcoin came along. You have bank accounts, those bank accounts have digital ledgers. You use those bank accounts to send payments electronically. That's digital money. Bitcoin isn't just digital money. Because Bitcoin is a fundamental transformation of the technology of money, and it's difficult to grasp because it is so different from everything we know before. So I'll take a different stab at it. I want to talk about network architecture for a second. Because Bitcoin is not happening in a vacuum. It's happening at a moment in history where we are seeing a transformation of many fundamental social institutions. And that transformation is the great network-centric era. For centuries, social institutions were organized around hierarchical organizations, institutions, democracy, banking, education. All of our social interactions were organized around appeal to authority in these hierarchies, these bureaucracies of people. And something happened with the invention of the internet. We started seeing more and more of these social institutions changing from systems that were closed, not transparent, unaccountable, hierarchical, complex with their own rules into platforms. We start seeing the introduction of systems that have interfaces, APIs, that we can access, where information can flow in and out of the organization. And so we go from institutions to platforms. And then we start seeing an even more important transformation when we go from platforms to protocols. And the interesting thing about the change between a platform and a protocol is when you have a protocol, there is no central appeal. TCP IP doesn't work in reference to a service provider. TCP IP works without context everywhere in the world. You don't have to sign up for an account to use TCP IP. You just have to use the language. And once you go from a platform to a language, it opens up all of these possibilities. Bitcoin is the first network-centric, protocol-based form of money. And what that means is that it exists without reference to an institutional or platform context. I'll get back to that in a second. This is a really important point. So we say that Bitcoin is peer-to-peer -peer money. What does that mean, peer-to-peer -peer money? It refers to an architecture, architecture used in terms of computer science or networking or distributed systems to describe the relationship between participants in a system. The architecture of Bitcoin is peer-to-peer -peer because every participant in the network speaks the Bitcoin protocol on an equal level. There are no special Bitcoin nodes. All nodes are the same. Peer-to-peer -peer means that when you do a transaction, every peer treats it the same. It has no context inside the peer's system other than that that it gets from the network. An interesting issue in distributed systems is this issue of context and state. Right? If you log on to Facebook and you have an account with Facebook, you're not using a protocol. All of the state is controlled by Facebook. You have a login session and all of the data is held by them. We call that architecture client-server. And Bitcoin is different because it's peer-to-peer, -peer, just like email or TCP IP. So, one of the interesting things that happens with money is that we are reluctant to discuss money. In fact, it is shocking that in almost all countries, money is not part of the education system. Five-year-olds have great questions about money, and most parents find it almost impossible to answer these questions. What is money, mommy? How does money work? 
Why do we not have more of it? Why can't everyone have more of it? And you don't say, Susie, go back to your room and study inflation like a good girl, and don't come back until you understand the answer to that question. We don't discuss money. Um, it's interesting that when you use the technology as a foundation of every aspect of social interaction almost, and yet it is a completely taboo subject. We all pretend that we don't particularly care about money, at least not intrinsically. We have higher goals and aspirations. We use it in everyday experience, but we don't really talk about it. It's a dirty topic. I think the architecture has something to do with it. You see, before Bitcoin, the previous iteration of money, the fourth great iteration of money, when money started being issued in exchange for precious metals stored in a vault, what that represented is a form of debt. And that's a really important concept to understand because it colors our discussion. How many of you have money in a bank? None of you have money in a bank. <laughs> Do you store physical money in a safe deposit box? Maybe then you could say you have money in the bank. Oh, a few people say that. The rest of you have loaned your money to a bank. And for the privilege of loaning your money to the bank, you will be paid the amazing interest sum of 0.00001% per year. And your bank will take that money, turn around, and loan it to the people standing next to you for 24.99% APR. This is a client-server relationship, because that money only exists as a form of debt in a ledger that you do not control. A ledger that is stored by a server, and you are simply a client. In fact, you have no control over that at all. You don't even have basic interfaces to that money, unless that interface is mediated by the server. That's what a client-server architecture does. We have another term in distributed systems that describes a particular form of client-server architecture where the secondary party only has a copy, a weak copy that isn't really meaningful. We call that a master-slave architecture. And if you think of the previous iteration of money as a master-slave architecture, you have to ask an uncomfortable question. Who is the slave? Because in a system of debt, one of the two parties is always the slave. You are the client. You are not the server. And the server doesn't really serve you. They serve themselves, because they are the master. And that is the architecture of money we live in. That is the architecture of money we use in our civilization. An architecture of money where you have no control. An architecture of money where every interaction is mediated by a third party. A third party that has absolute control over that money. And today, if you go to the ATM machine and you put into your card, the bank may decide to give you your money. And one day, as the people of Cyprus, Greece, Venezuela, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, and a list of hundreds of countries over the last several decades and even centuries have discovered, one day you go to the bank and the bank does not want to give you the money because they don't have to. And that's the essence of a master-slave relationship. Bitcoin is fundamentally different because in Bitcoin you don't owe anyone anything and no one owes you anything. It is not a system based on debt. It is a system based on ownership of this abstract token. Absolute ownership. We have an expression in the United States which is, possession is nine-tenths of the law. Have you heard that expression? In Bitcoin, possession is ten-tenths of the law. If you control the Bitcoin keys, it's your Bitcoin. If you don't control the Bitcoin keys, it's not your Bitcoin. You are back to a master-slave relationship with a bank. Bitcoin represents a fundamental transformation of money, an invention that changes the oldest technology we have in civilization, that changes it radically and disruptively by changing the fundamental architecture 
into one where every participant is equal, where a transaction has no state or context other than obeying the consensus rules of the network that no one controls, where your money is yours, and you control it absolutely through the application of digital signatures, and no one can censor it, no one can seize it, no one can freeze it, no one can tell you what to do or what not to do with your money. It is a system of money that is simultaneously absolutely transnational and borderless. And we've never had a system of money like that. It is a system of money that transmits at the speed of light, that anyone in the world can participate with a device as simple as a text messaging phone. And this represents a technological innovation that is terrifying to a lot of people because it is such a fundamental transformation of money. And what they will tell you is that they're worried. They're very worried. They're worried that criminals will use Bitcoin. But the truth is that they're far more terrified than all of the rest of us will. Thank you. Um, you want to th throw the first mic or? No, I'm not good at throwing. I'm better at coding. Go okay, ahead. Well, I if I could throw, I'd be on the basketball team and not the computer programming team. First of all, uh, thank you. Um, I have a question. You were talking about scarcity and um, also about. Um, uh, what's sorry? What's it called again? The, the intrinsic value. Yes. Uh, if you look at the the, um, the definition of sound more money according to Aristoteles, um, he said that well, he described gold basically as you just did, um, and he said that the intrinsic value of gold was its scarcity. Do you believe that the same thing goes for Bitcoin? Um, so as a Greek, I think I can say this safely. Aristotle said many smart things, and Aristotle also said many absolutely idiotic things, which in the context of the time were fine, but uh, in retrospect, we know better and understand more about the world around us. Scarcity isn't intrinsic value. Scarcity is a completely different attribute of money. Um, and in fact, intrinsic value is a very slippery concept. Uh, we haven't had money with intrinsic value since our money was bananas, because you can eat them. And in fact, uh, unless you have scarcity, even the things that you might assume have intrinsic value do not have intrinsic value. And the most important aspects of life, like water, have intrinsic value only when they are scarce. So scarcity affects intrinsic value, but is not intrinsic value. In this country, as also in my country, we use fresh water to flush our toilets. And uh, that shows you exactly how much value fresh water has <laughs> intrinsically here because of a lack of scarcity. Um, you know, I know that the Netherlands has a much bigger problem with keeping the water out than <laughs> having enough. Uh, but there are plenty of places where that's not the case. Intrinsic value is not really a property of uh, currency or money. Uh, in fact, um, currency that has intrinsic value is not very good currency, because then you might eat it instead. Uh, it creates a market distortion, because if you can eat your currency, at some point, if the value of currency goes low enough, everybody starts eating it instead of using it. Although you can assign an intrinsic value to money. My favorite example was a farmer in Zimbabwe who was asked by the BBC when they were carrying a wheelbarrow full of hundred trillion dollar Zimbabwe notes stacked up, and they asked them, can't you use it as fuel? And they said, no, not really, because goat shit burns better. <laughs> and that was the moment that the currency's intrinsic value had degraded to the point that it was below par with goat shit. Now, I have news for you. There are at least 50 currencies in the world today that have an intrinsic value less than goat shit. Um, and that is the world in which we're introducing Bitcoin. A more interesting concept, I think, one that we should explore more, is intrinsic utility. Um, something that is useful as a currency. And I think that Bitcoin represents a moment of immense intrinsic utility. It is useful. 
It is software money. Money is a content type. Money as a service, programmable money that can be programmed to do amazing things, and that provides intrinsic utility. Utility that makes it much more than just money for the internet, but instead turns it into the internet of money. Uh, so intrinsic utility, I think, is a more useful concept. Let's uh, throw the hi, ball. hi, Andreas. Um, I wanted to ask your opinion. Is that Max? Yes, hello. Oh, hey. Nice. hello I didn't Andreas. know you were here. Hey, hello. you recognize my voice, as many people do. I'm like, so honored. Oh, it's that New Yorker again. <laughs> okay, so um, the banks are now getting into blockchain. You have nine banks creating a consortium. Uh, apparently, so uh, like they're competing with blockchain, et cetera. So, just what are your thoughts on this? Is it is it competition? Uh, where's it going? Your thoughts? Thanks. Um, how many of you here are familiar with the concept of an intranet or have an intranet at work? So, an intranet is the internal company network where all of the information that is out of date about the company is posted and where you can't use most of the interesting applications on the internet, but they force you to use it anyway. So, the problem with an internet is that eventually you want to make it more useful, and then you try to find a way to connect it to the rest of the intranets around, and to do that, you use an internet. Um, and I think what we're going to discover is that this approach of trying to take, oh, let's see, well, we told the world that we wanted to disrupt our business. In fact, we said we wanted to disrupt our business from the inside out, because that sounds good on a marketing brochure. And uh, then we discovered Bitcoin, but that's too disruptive, too revolutionary. We want something more corporate, like the word revolutionize, which means the exact opposite of revolutionary. <laughs> it means to strip something of anything that is disruptive, turn it into a safe, mild, bland alternative that kind of fits the marketing brochure, and then try to pretend that is revolutionary. It's like the difference between Che Guevara and a Che Guevara t-shirt being worn by a hipster in Brooklyn. <laughs> so what do they do? They look at Bitcoin and they say, let's see, it's an open, decentralized, borderless, transparent, and peer-to-peer -peer currency, fantastic. Could we have that without the open, borderless, decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer and transparent, and instead add a nice dose of heavy control and turn it into a client-server model? Oh, sorry, I meant a master-slave model. Blockchains are going to decrease the cost of operating clearinghouses within the world stock exchanges and banking systems. They will replace single point of failure clearing houses and payment networks like SWIFT and DTCC and all of the other mm -hmm. uh, stock market back ends in the world, and they're going to reduce the cost of investment banking. Woohoo! Um, that's not going to change the world, and it really is a minor and boring application, but I can see why it's better than what they have today. To me, the equivalent is really simple. When the internet came out, what did the world's phone companies do? They designed color fax machines. Take the fax machine, add color. Look, it's just like the internet. All right, next question. Hi, uh, Andreas. Thank you very much for that uh, talk. What, what, in your opinion, are the biggest threats or problems at the moment in the Bitcoin ecosystem? The biggest threats or problems? Um, there are many threats. I think um, you know, Bitcoin is very much an experimental technology. It's an instance. I think it's important to separate the design pattern from the particular implementation we're running right now. I can give you a prediction uh, over the next 50 years. The design pattern of open, decentralized digital currencies based on blockchain technology will completely transform the world. Whether it will use the exact same technology we use in Bitcoin today, whether Bitcoin will continue to evolve as it has for the last six years very rapidly, and be able to address all of the difficulties, get better user interface design, better security, um, scale to much higher levels, and all of those things, 
I don't know. I think most likely whatever we end up with will still be called Bitcoin, even though it may bear very little resemblance in its underlying engineering to what we have today. But it will still be an open, decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer platform for money. Not because that's an efficient way of doing money, it's because it's a free way of doing money. And sometimes efficiency is something you sacrifice for freedom. Bitcoin is not efficient. If you want efficient, you use a system where one person is in control, and that is very, very efficient. Democracy isn't very efficient either, but it's sure as hell better than the alternative. All right, let's take yeah. uh, maybe one or two more questions. Okay. Um, talking about uh, public and private, I think um, you, that the internet is, is considered as a com common good. And do you see the Bitcoin as a, a public good, as a private good, as a common good, or a, or a new term? Um, and um, how can we use it for public goals? Mm -hmm. no. Well, I think that's a really good question. I think the blockchain is a public good. Um, it, it is a societal construct that uh, is not controlled by any one individual, that is ruled entirely by a set of common principles and laws called the consensus mechanism. And the, the rules of consensus define what happens on the blockchain. Interestingly enough, I think the blockchain will create a completely new form of common good that we've never seen before. If you accept the idea that Bitcoin or something very much like it will continue to exist, we arrive at a place where, for the first time in history, we have a shared historical record that does not decay in time and cannot be changed. Immutable history forever. We have an expression which is, um, you know, put it in stone. Have you heard that expression? It's an expression we use to describe the most immutable form of recording we can imagine, which is to carve something in stone. Twenty years from now, we will say, oh, it's as good as done. It's like I put it on the blockchain. Because we will have a much better form of an immutable history. So that becomes a public good, and it becomes a public good that has a scale in time that we've never seen as a civilization. I mean, if you think of what happens if the Bitcoin lasts 10 years and the blockchain lasts 10 years, that's astonishing. But what if it lasts 100 years? What if it lasts 1,000 years? What happens if 2,000 years from now you can go back and do blockchain archaeology and study the transactions between Satoshi Nakamoto and Hal Finney, or um, study the 2020 presidential campaign based on blockchain transactions? This is a, a very important historical artifact that we're now creating as a civilization. So yes, it is a public good. Um, you, you, oh, you, you talked uh, about the uh, properties of good money, and uh, in the light of the news I saw tomorrow about uh, BitPay blacklisting a transaction, um, I would ask you if you have worries about the fungibility of Bitcoin due to the trackable nature. Yes, um, I think fungibility is one of the things that uh, Bitcoin can definitely improve, and I think over time we're going to see some improvements to that. There's already quite a few uh, proposals on different ways to increase fungibility and anonymity. If we want to preserve this blockchain technology as a good that is resistant to censorship and surveillance and control, that really transforms our monetary system, makes it global, makes it transparent, uh, makes it possible for the whole world to be part of it, uh, we really need to address the issue of uh, fungibility. Uh, blacklists are inherently evil. They uh, cede control to the author of the blacklist, and that control is absolute. It's one of the fundamental problems we have in our banking system today. Think about it this way. It's now 2015. We've had mainstream internet for 15 years. Now, if you look at the statistics of economic inclusion in the world, how many people have access to financial services through this wonderful gift we have in humanity, which is the internet, economic inclusion has decreased. Why? Because we have found more ways to surveil, control, and play geopolitical games. And now we cut off entire countries from the international financial system. That is not a healthy 
way to approach life. And so I think the metric of economic inclusion is very much affected by fungibility and blacklists are antithetical to democracy. They're antithetical to freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of speech, which as principles of the Enlightenment is something that we should aspire to. If your government is worried about their own citizens controlling their money, the most important question you have to ask is, what the hell is wrong with my government? Not what the hell is wrong with Bitcoin. One more question. One question. Okay, last question. Yeah, um, this morning, Mr. Middelkoop was uh, telling us that <clears throat> China and Russia are uh, uh, getting a lot of gold, and that the states are more or less uh, bypassed in this action. Does it mean that the United States has seen the light now and go for Bitcoin? I, I'm, I wasn't quite sure I understood the question. I'm sorry. Could you? Could you? They, they're getting a lot of gold. You said. Yeah, uh, the amount of gold is going to uh, China and to Russia nowadays. Ah, yes. Yeah. So, and the states uh, in the Western world is more get more or less uh, getting rid of gold. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that they have seen the light and go for Bitcoin? Uh, no, it, it doesn't mean they have seen the light. It means that we are now living in a world where we're facing the most unprecedented currency and central banking crisis that we've seen since the introduction of central banking. I mean, a lot of people say, you know, what does it take for Bitcoin to succeed? Uh, how do we make sure that Bitcoin can beat the banks or replace the banks or eradicate central banking? Um, we don't need to do that. Bitcoin should not be aiming to conquer or co-opt or force anyone to adopt anything. Bitcoin is opt-in and it's a choice. We're not looking for governments to endorse or adopt Bitcoin. That makes no sense. The idea of a national currency is as ridiculous and obsolete as the idea of a national airline or a national phone company or a king. Uh, we need to get rid of these things. <laughs> The bottom line is that the banking system as we know it today does not need help to become obsolete. It's doing a very good job on its own. When you have a giant centralized structure, the biggest risk it faces is that by its very nature, centralization introduces fragility into the system. The narrower the source of decisions, the more likely those decisions are they're disconnected from reality. And we've seen that central planning fails, and yet we accept central planning and monetary policy as if somehow that is exempt from that rule. Centralized systems are fragile and they fail on their own. There is a reason why 21 central banks around the world have set their interest rates to zero for six years and cannot seem to get out of that trap. They say that currencies require control in order to be stable, and yet we have unstable currencies and central banks that have lost all control, even though supposedly they have the tools. So the real question we should ask is not whether Bitcoin will succeed, but whether we face a really substantial risk of our traditional monetary policy tools failing catastrophically all around the world. I just hope that when that time comes, Bitcoin will be there to pick up the pieces, along with many other digital currencies, because the world has to continue to be able to transact. And currency failure is a catastrophic event in any country. I've seen it in my own country, in Greece. I saw it wipe out my parents twice in a single generation and everybody around us. And this has happened all across the world. The natural state of a state-sponsored currency is collapse. Statistically speaking, uh, there are only a few exceptions, and they don't last very long. So, really, this is not about Bitcoin winning. Banks are losing on their own. They don't need any help. Andres, uh, thank you so much. I also really like the, the master-slave analogy, because we have now Blythe Masters, I think, in charge of a blockchain consortium. So maybe it's a coincidence or not, I don't know. Uh, we have uh, a few presents from you from um, 
Well, first of all, the people in here know you like stroopwafels, so <laughs> the guys from Arnhem, they're sitting in the front, they, they brought some stroopwafels for you. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, thank you. And we also have um, the Belgian Bitcoin community here, and they this whole basket, I'm not sure how you're going to... In the United States, <laughs> it's uh, considered polite to open your presents. I need one. Now, I'm going to claim that that's the reason why I'm doing this. <laughs> it's been a while. And then also from um, the, the Belgian community, we have here a nice uh, basket of uh, Belgian beers and some, um, some fruit. So, on behalf Thank of the Belgian... Thank you so Bitcoin much. Community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas.